So good afternoon, everyone. It's almost the end of the work week here on Friday at 4 p.m. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so this is the final uh, virtual offering as part of NAMI Greater Cleveland's participation in the NAMI National Pathways to Hope 2024 conference. Uh, the topic for discussion today is with Deandra Benson, who's a um, mental health professional here in the Cleveland area and has been presenting for NAMI Greater Cleveland for a number of years now. The topic is understanding mental health and suicide uh, contextual factors pertaining to the Black Church. Uh, very happy to have DeAndre here to provide this presentation for us. Um, do be a, do note that this is being recorded. We will upload it to the NAMI Greater Cleveland YouTube channel uh, sometime next week. Uh, please note there are no CEUs for any of the webinars today. We do offer CEUs for some of our other programs that are upcoming through the end of the year. Uh, and we'll also ask you to complete a short survey for us and we wrap up here. Um, but please do remain muted unless, of course, you have a question and you want to share by speaking. You can also utilize the chat feature if you have questions. I will be monitoring that as well. So um, I think at this stage, I will pass it over to Deandra to introduce herself and get us started. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Hello, everyone. I, like Matt said, I'm Deandra Benson. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor and psychology postdoc here in Ohio. Um, I'm glad to hear to speak with you on a topic that is central to a lot of my clinical interests and research interests today. Um, so as 2024 is moving along. We are just about to enter Suicide Prevention Month, which is the month of September. Um, when we observe that and talk about issues that are pertinent to us here. So first off, talking about our goals for the day, um, we're going to explore contextual factors as they relate to African Americans and Black Americans. We're going to talk about some theoretical models. Um, explore some historical current attitudes, trends in the Black church, and explore ways that leaders in Black churches are able to support. Um, just a note, I will use the terms African American, Black, Black American interchangeably um, as they relate to um, a lot of the framework of the works talked about. There's a lot of cultural gloss in the field of research, Americans, Black people in the United States as a whole. So it's important that we note that um, and contribute to more within group understanding as it relates to Black people. So I'd like to put that pin in that discussion. I also want to make sure that we are aware that we have to take good care. That is in our language related to suicide, in our engagement in this topic. And so I encourage you to engage in self-care at moments when we are talking about challenging topics, often topics that are taboo or often topics that have visited our own lives. So if you need to stretch, if you need to do some deep breathing, do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself in this conversation. I also want to make sure that we are aware of our language. And um, I was reminded this week in a meeting where a colleague said, oh, we can kill two birds with one stone. And another colleague said, well, I have pet birds and suggested that one could say we can feed two birds with one seed. So in talking about language, it is super important that we are aware of our intent and our impact um, and just to put a note on some of the pieces when it comes to language talking about suicide, um, oftentimes we will hear people say commit or committed suicide, and the movement is to talk about what use specificity and talk about a person dying by suicide, or more recently, suicided as a verb, um, rather than talking about successful, unsuccessful, um, completed, we'll say failed suicide or completed or completed suicide, we'll say died by suicide. Instead of saying epidemic, skyrocketing, 
rocketing, we'll say rising increasing rates. And instead of saying someone blank is suicidal, we might prefer to use person first language. Um, someone is struggling with suicidal thoughts. Oftentimes, when we have a discussion about suicide risk overall, we will talk about suicide and breakdowns as they relate to race and ethnicity. Uh, we'll start hearing about rates overall, okay? This group has more deaths by suicide than this group, and that is about where our inquiry um, stops. It also kind of perpetuates a lay myth that we often hear that Black people don't die by suicide. And so there's a lot of questions here, and we oftentimes get hung up on this. Around 2015, there started, there was a article that was released um, looking at rates of suicide specifically among Black children, especially in the rates of suicide among the youngest groups. And we started asking a lot of questions about our interventions, about the types of um, presentations that we were seeing. We've also seen, um, we also were starting to see an increase in suicide overall. And one thing about our rates as of late is we've seen an overall decrease in suicide, which is great. But we're also seeing an increase in rates of suicide among Black people, which is contrary to the historical trends and have been called as a, um, as a paradox. So despite the um, stressors and challenges that Black people have experienced in the United States, um, rates of suicide weathering stress has been something that, you know, it's been assumed that Black people have figured out how to do. Um, so this is an alarming model when we're seeing decreases overall, but increases among Black people. We are also seeing extreme increases in rates of suicide among teen Black teenagers. Um, this is also paired with the curve as we look over the lifespan, um, one thing in particular is among all groups in the U.S., overall U.S. rates increase with age. We might see a peak in middle age and peaks in later in life, um, contributing to demographic narratives about white males nearing retirement age being at great risk for suicide. Um, among Black people, we see a different traje trajectory. We see an increase in rates at younger, the younger end of the spectrum and an increase towards the older end of the spectrum and a decrease towards the older end of the spectrum. So we have to think about our focus and our shift and the needs for intervention as we look across the lifespan. So uh, if you think about things like primary prevention efforts for the whole population, zero suicide, all of that is wonderful when we are looking at the larger impact. Um, but if we are considering within group um, needs, we also need to consider specific needs for that population. So for black people, our overall, what works for the whole doesn't necessarily work specifically for this population in this group. We're missing something. We're also seeing rates of suicide that are on par with peers um, when it comes to making plans, ideation, and completion. Um, we're seeing these increases when we never saw those in the past. And so it's becoming an issue worldwide. And so specific research here is needed. Um, there's a lot of questions about data, about reporting, about accuracy. And so it is a lot more important that we are working to have that specificity. I like to put some context on all of these factors here. Um, so if you think about, I've heard it said that, you know, things like microaggressions, day-to-day -day stressors are like a thumbprint. If a bunch of people were to press their thumbprint into your shoulder, the first 10 would be annoying. You'd probably roll your eyes, 
a hundred, even more so, maybe you're starting to develop some soreness or react or hypervigilance to it. A thousand, you'll, you might have a bruise. And so these day-to-day -day stressors that exist maybe on the in individual interpersonal levels can be like that thumbprint being pushed into a person's shoulder. And so it's so very important that we have cultural competence, we have cultural humility and understanding individuals. And we are also aware of the specific needs of individuals across cultures because that is going to impact symptomatology, the um, exposures that individuals have. We've seen research with um, presentations being consistent with what individuals' cultural realities are. Factors contributing to suicide risk. We see systematic oppression, we see racism, discrimination, and the impacts of intergenerational trauma overall. Uh, so talking about stigma, that contributes to that. And so mental health disorders such as depression, anxiety, trauma are prevalent among Black people in the U.S. The challenge here is addressing the underlying drivers and causes. Um, so if we're talking about social isolation, historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, these sorts of things play a role. And um, I've heard it said that um, anti-racism is suicide prevention work. All of these things relate to quality of life for an individual. Talking about a primary overarching thing of theme of suicidality. So the interpersonal theory of suicidality is a theory coined by Thomas Joyner. He's a researcher at the University of Florida um, who studies suicide and also survived the death of his father by suicide. He posits that there's kind of a calculation that occurs where Individuals may, be, um, may desire suicide if they experience perceived burdensomeness, and that is a feeling that one is so ineffective to the degree that others are burdened by their presence. And also that a theme of thwarted belongingness, which is, you know, I don't fit, um, adjustments, I'm, so, I'm ineffective, I... Um, do not have a place and that lack of adjustment. So Thomas Joyner is a white male psychologist. Um, he writes in his book about his father's death by suicide. Um, and the months before his father's death, his father started attending black churches. Um, anecdotally, he says he wonders if his father was seeking the warmth, the belongingness and community that exists in these spaces um, as he was wrestling with death. So we think about the desire for suicide and also it's matched with habituation or a capacity to enact lethal injury. And that habituation process by happens through repeated exposure to negative events, um, repeated injuries, pain, trauma, et cetera, violence, injury, and that pairs together. So we have a large Venn diagram of individuals who desire suicide. We have individuals who are capable of that harm and a much smaller segment of the population who might make a serious attempt or may die by suicide. Um, and so a lot of Joyner's theory is helpful to consider Okay, so if these are the drivers or the things that might cause one to desire suicide, how can we intervene? Um, and so that is where a sense of belongingness, a sense of connection comes in through social connections, through um, clinical interventions and contacts, we can intervene and we can try to assist and support people. That brings me back to our thumbprint. So, you know, we also think about habituation and exposure over time to suicide, to negative events. If we are able to decrease exposures as well, 
we might also be able to decrease capacity. Kind of talking about trauma, we'll put a pin in this discussion as well, but um, um, thoughts of trauma creates hyperarousal, a sense of nervousness, startling, um, avoidance and withdrawing, pulling back, feeling numb, shut down, re-experiencing constant exposure to things and avoidance of possible triggers or possible cues that might remind someone. It is said that trauma symptoms can turn into adaptations. So that traumatic experience or in the moment exposure is over and not as threatening to in the individual. But if I have learned to survive under those conditions, I might continue to use those things that were once adaptive for me um, in ways that um, aren't adaptive in different environments. And so that's when we see symptoms. And when we're seeing symptoms of a trauma survivor, it's always important to ask ourselves, what happened to you? And what purpose does this behavior that I'm seeing serve as opposed to what is wrong with you, specifically putting the responsibility on the individual? And so we are seeing symptoms of trauma, of depression, of anxiety, perfectionism. All of these are normal reactions to abnormal stressors and abnormal ways of living. So there is a lot of discussion about mental health treatment that is directed by trauma-informed care principles. And so that is essentially a thorough understanding of the profound neurological, physical, biological, and psychological effects of trauma on the individual. And it's an appreciation of that high prevalence of traumatic experiences individuals um, go through. It's often likened to primary prevention or universal precautions with um, germs and infection exposure. You know, everyone's told to wash their hands as primary prevention, just as in trauma-informed care, we are to assume, you know, everyone we know, we come around, is fighting their own battle and experiencing their own stuff. So let's put a pin in that discussion as the mental health world and kind of move over to the church. So um, the importance of the church in the Black community, it's the organizing body. Um, I grew up with the term of being churched and understanding that this is the training ground where um, a lot of other things come about. We're socialized in this educational way such that um, even non-religious individuals identify churches as that organizing body. I am the daughter of a Baptist minister. And so I witnessed that transformative healing power in church communities. And that brought about a lot of my own experiences and desire to become a psychologist. We learn some other things in church. We learn social skills. We learn leadership skills. We learn how to interact with other. We learn giving. We learn even Robert's roles of order. Um, all of those things um, teach us socialization and bring to other experiences in the world. And so also it's a part of belongingness and identity for Black Americans. It's had this central process. And so um, for identity, identity can oftentimes be connected to belongingness as connecting to something larger than oneself. It's meaning, it's affirming, it's consciousness. It is that space where we interact and we are. So thinking about suicides in the Bible, um, in Sunday school, we're often told about some of these experiences. King Saul falling on his own sword after a defeat, Samson pulling down the pillars, um, causing his own death, Judas hanging himself. And I think in a lot of people's recollections, these are discussed not as a direct account of suicide, but mentions of things that within today's measure would be viewed as an unhealthy coping mechanism. And so there's somewhat of a divide between the narratives that we hear or 
learn about in the Bible and the church experiences and the things that individuals sh sh struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there are quite a few differences in understandings or how we define whether suicide is a sin, a result of extreme despair, and lots of perspectives. So there's a lot that we have to contend with in our everyday narratives. Um, if someone is struggling emotionally, are they plagued by demons? If someone is loves God, do they struggle? Is taking medication for mental illness, not trusting God, um, in an article I was looking over in preparation for this, I saw a mention of a pastor saying, if you pray, you don't need a Prozac. So uh, I think these are worthy of a complex theological discussion, but I'm also reminded of Jesus's disciples asking about the blind man's affliction. Was this a result of his own sins? Was this a result of his parents' sins? And Jesus's response is about the transformative power of God in the world. And at the end of the day, we are all complex built beings in this broken world. And so we have to have some discussions about how do we make sense of what we see in the Bible, what our narratives have been, and how we make sense of that in context with the people who are presenting in the church. So we have to address stigma. We have to promote open dialogue in the church. We have to have conversations about that and create safe spaces where education and the realities of people's lives are presented to us. We have to be able to incorporate this with our religious teachings. So we have to provide some context to that and in relevant manners. You can have, I've ha heard it said, you can have God and a therapist and a psychiatrist. And I think that's where a lot of this lies. Talking about preparing ourselves to intervene and assist others. We have to lead with self-awareness. We have to look at the, uh, we can't look at the speck in someone else's eye while we have a log in our own. And so we have to have conversations about our own self-awareness. What kind of things frighten me? How do I um, lead with that awareness of myself and the reactions that I'm having, the things that I have um, that I believe, and what I might be imposing on a person? So it's important to kind of start asking ourselves some questions before we start to work with others. When it comes to suicide risk, we are looking at different, uh-oh, runaway PowerPoint. Okay. We are looking at different um, possible risk factors. Um, first off, verbal cues. Wait. Um. Verbal clues, things that people might say directly. Give me one moment. All right. Are you able to see? Yes, we see the lay helpers slide. Okay. All right. Verbal cues. We want to be aware of what individuals are experiencing. 
Hmm. Okay. So when we're talking about what to look for, um, oftentimes we are looking for a change in someone's presentation and baseline. Um, someone might verbally say things such as, you won't have to worry about me too much anymore, or um, things like, I'm feeling like taking my life. Most people do um, share something with someone. Behavioral clues. We're going to see changes in patterns, changes in behavior. Are the person giving away items? Is the person um, taking more risks? Do they seem happier or less burdened than previously before? Situational challenges in life. Um, and so we want to be able to intervene and assist people. And the reality is that people within our communities, people we know are most likely to be able to intervene and respond. So a lot of times we are preparing individuals on a person to person level. This is taking psychological first aid that is participating in groups like this and learning and educating individuals. There's something called QPR, question, persuade, refer, which has been likened to CPR. It's an initial first response to suicidal ideation. And so, you know, the first step in that is questioning, asking the question, saying to a person, hey, I'm noticing whatever behavior change. I'm noticing um, talk of hopelessness. Are you having thoughts of suicide? And we want to ask that question very directly head on. Um, and a lot of times people are nervous about what do I say or how do I say that question? And it's less about specifically how you say it or the words that come out, but that you are sharing that you are concerned. Um, and one thing not to do is you're not suicidal, are you? Um, we want to be open. We want to attenuate some of that and make sure that people understand that we are here to listen. Um, and a lot of people in response to being asked are like, I have somebody who wants to know who I can talk to about this, who I can really engage, somebody who cares enough to know and understand. And so I try to encourage people to not be afraid to ask that question. The next step in that QPR sequence would be persuade. We're going to listen to the problem. You're going to give your full attention. So we have to remember that suicide's not the problem. It's that solution that that person is having. They don't feel like they have a response to it. And we don't want to rush to judgment. We want to make sure that we are open we are not giving somebody false hope. Uh, Dion, and finally, if you're um, advancing the slides, but I think we're frozen on lay helpers. Okay. I do not have, for some reason, my slides are off or pushing forward. So I'm talking about a few that okay. you guys mm -hmm. can't see. And I apologize, but. Okay. Just wanted to check. Thank you. Um. And finally, we want to ask, um, you know, will you go with me to get help? Um, will you let me get, get you to help? And we want to make sure that we are referring them to a prof professional or someone who is trained to uh, intervene and address that. The tools in our toolbox while we are doing that um, are not always things that come with clinical training. That is good listening skills, that's patience, that's um, trustworthiness. Those are people skills that many of us do have. We want to be an attentive listener and address needs for safety. We want to help people get to the th meet needs. We want to create a sense of connect connectedness and give people a sense of personal control, self-advocacy in that moment. Things to not do, force people to share their stories with you. Um, giving simple reassurances. Oftentimes I hear spiritual gloss being applied in these situations. Um, telling people why you think they're um, going through this in their life. 
they're being punished by whatever ill deed they have done in life and finally making promises that can't be kept. Oh, it'll be okay. Um, and that it'll be okay is different than I believe that it will be okay. Or I believe this making statements, um, promises that cannot be kept. Talking, talking about the mindset of people oftentimes when they are struggling with suicidal thoughts, um, people oftentimes believe they can't be helped. Um, that is because with depression comes cognitive construction. And I've heard it being described as a horse with blinders on, being prepared for a race. I'm straightforward. My ca capacity for problem solving is different because I get into some um, thinking traps that could be all or nothing thinking all you know so it's so very important that ideally we help give that person a warm handoff to a referral source a person who can help for help ask for help next best is getting a commitment for help and then making arrangements and third best is like giving someone information um, if someone is actively suicidal, we want to make sure they are directly handed off to some sort of help, whether that's a call to a suicide hotline and making a plan for intervention and assessment, whether that's helping to them to get to an emergency room, helping them get to a mental health provider, or calling 911 and waiting for first responders to arrive. Talking about interventions and support systems that exist. Um, there are crisis helplines and hotlines out there. Many of the crisis hotlines associated with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline are associated with um, crisis centers. So in Cuyahoga County, the mobile crisis team answers calls that come through 988 or the 1-800-273-8255 number. 24 hours a day, someone can call and get in touch with a trained provider, uh, many of whom who are licensed mental health professionals and set up intervention times for assessments and other intervention support. Um, it is important that we are establishing support groups within our churches, um, places that are relevant and consistent with people's experiences in the world. Um, that we are training church members for a first response and that there is a space for discussion within pastoral counseling circles about what help exists out there. We have to have education about mental health in the church, education about church, about mental health systems and be that broker the church is really poised to stand in the gap in those situations and speak to the experiences that people are having. Um, at Mobile Crisis, I had several, I've responded to several churches because that was the space where people felt comfortable getting assistance and support. Um, and so those things can exist. Unfortunately, churches are part of the, well, fortunately and unfortunately, churches are a part of the whole lifespan. And, you know, there is a part for postvention in churches, having conversations for grief support groups, and having space for death by suicide in those groups of grief support groups. I've heard of common of common experiences of people who have survived deaths by suicide is that oftentimes people do not want to talk about it or do not know how to talk about it. And so we have to provide space for that. You know, rights, cemeteries, funerals are for the living and not necessarily the deceased. And if it is actually ashes to ashes, dust to dust, we really need to be able to minister to the people who are present. Um, we need to emphasize the importance of hope, of empathy, of support, and really showing um, ourselves as people 
first, encouraging us to have those conversations, um, encouraging safe spaces for dialogue, not suppressing that due to stigma, but really allowing people to have facilitated discussions. Discussions do not give people ideas, but do free up space to have those conversations and to um, appropriately minister and respond to the things that people are needing. And finally, um, pastoral care for survivors, being present, um, addressing feelings of guilt, shame, confusion, all that comes up in the face of death by suicide for survivors. Churches are also in a place because of that organizing space as political um, fixtures is we're in spaces to advocate for policy, for change, um, for Black children. Schools are the primary space where children get mental health care. There are pros to that, meaning that there are opportunities for accessibilities. The drawbacks of that are that um, oftentimes there are spaces that people don't necessarily feel 100% safe. And so if churches can try to allow some of that in, in a responsible way, we can definitely start to address mental health concerns. So talking about getting help, um, what to do if you are experiencing any mental health co concern, stress, depression, or even suicidal ideation, finding a good therapist, um, looking at balance in life, getting nutrition in order, all of those things that go in with self-care, grounding, dropping an anchor. There are so many aspects of a church service and specifically Black church services that are grounding, that are meditation, that are mindful, repetitive things that actually speak to our neuro neurology and our trauma-informed. Um, we are able to talk about those connections. And we also have a lot of access to mental health supports and guidance out there. Um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline 988 number is available anytime you can call. You're directed to um, the center closest to where you live or actually your area code on your phone. Um, local numbers there. NAMI Greater Cleveland operates a helpline where you can get support and referral. Um, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has a lot of supports as what information, they fund research, and also have what's called a soul shop. So they do a lot around training um, clergy members for um, giving appropriate pastoral care. Um, there are several others out there in the space who are working to intervene when it comes to suicidal, suicidality. So I'm going to stop and open up to questions or conversations. Are you reading Sherry's question? Deandra, Sherry's I'm question. Yes. Yeah, so Sherry asks, where can we find most current stats available by county, city, state? I'm often asked about this. Has anyone looked mm -hmm. at cross comparison of the rates of death and growing suicide rate populations like Black youth from non-suicide causes, especially violence in the community? Um, so yes and no. That's complicated. I think one of the reasons is because data is not so clear as it relates to this population. Um, they were talking about that with the youngest population and increase in suicides by Black boys. Um, I can see where a lot of people would not necessarily um, qualify or create a space you know, coding a death as suicide. Um, not everything is so clear. Um, violence, drug deaths, all of those things um, are attributed by external judges. Um, I think the most recent data is the CDC data. Um, 
And also last year, there was um, a report through the National Black um, Congressional Caucus um, still bringing, let me back up. In 2015, there was a report ringing the alarm for youth suicide. Last year, there was a report, um, is, are we still ringing the alarm that came out as a response to it? Um, that is a good source of it. The National Black Co Congressional Congress has a report that they released as well. Um, so those are the places where data is being gathered, um, but there are still quite a few limitations in that data. Can we talk a little bit about why I'm posing these questions? Because I really think we need better, clearer research on this. And this is my anecdotal experience, but I'm in Buffalo, New York. Okay. If you know anything about Buffalo, New York, it is one of the most racist cities in the country and historically has been so forever. Um, and so I have not seen numbers. I get asked about this all the time. How does our city or county look compared to the rest of the nation overall or to other places? Are we doing any better or worse? And is, I don't have a clear answer for that question, especially in light of, of two things. One is our level of day-to-day -day community violence is so extreme and brutal and the trauma that is revisited on our community over and over and over has had what I believe, again, anecdotally, um, a devastating effect on the ability of our young people to have hope. And if, you know, I'm sure if you look at the Youth Risk Behavior Survey or, you know, many of the other tools that exist in terms of assessing uh, children's resilience and, you know, a you can look at ACEs, you can look at risk behavior, you can look at any of those things. And they will tell you that our Black kids are really, really suffering. Uh, but that suffering alone is not new. Mm -hmm. An extreme increase in the rate of suicide in our kids' population would, I think, be newer and something that warrants the red alarm from the initial data from the CDC and I think overrides the the tendency now in some reports to say, well, we're, we're over-hyping this. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk to Black kids in my city, they feel hopeless. Mm -hmm. And we are a community where when you wake up in the morning, you hear what were the latest incidents of violence overnight, and then you wait for the names because we are a city that does not have six degrees of separation. It's one and a half on a bad day. And so the chances are, you know, either the victim or somebody who's being arrested and charged for that violence. And the trauma never stops for our kids. And the question of how to rebuild hope, it's not just how do we pre prevent suicide? It can't be because the answer has to be how do we have them live into life, not avoid suicide? And that is the key question of hope, I think. And we need data to work with on that. Definitely. We, Def when you when you go to policymakers and funders and you say, we have to work on giving kids hope, they're like, oh yeah, okay, right. No, no, no. I am militant about this. When a 21-year-old on America's Got Talent is asked, what does it mean for you to be here? And stands there and cries and, from Buffalo, who works in a daycare and is raising the next generation of children weeps openly online and says, my fiance pushed me to be here and my being here is restoring my hope. Well, hallelujah for that. But you know what? 
99.99% of our kids aren't going to be on America's Got Talent. We have to do something else now. And it's very hard to argue for it when you don't have rock solid data and the churches coming out to speak on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, our churches bury kids and family members every single day from the violence in our community. It's intolerable. And I don't know the I I don't have the answer. I'm not I'm not anybody's savior, but I will roll up my sleeves and work with anybody because our kids deserve better than this. Yeah. I so unfortunately the coroner's office might be that source of data locally. Um yes. and we are dependent upon them for appropriate um coding of that data. That's right. a big deal. Um, I think so in 2015, when I kind of started some of this journey, that was, um, a time when we did not have data on empirically supported treatments as they relate to suicide. Um, since then there has been some hope for, um, systemic interventions. And that was some of my, um, road to, um, and, intensive home-based treatment, um, systemic interventions that involve the whole community, the family, um, because we're also noting that Black youth report suicidality differently. They report depression differently. There are different thresholds and cutoff scores, um, different um, inciting events tend to be more interpersonal as people work at it. Um, there's also a researcher, I believe at DePaul, who is looking at hopelessness and um, community violence and interacting um, suicide and the, the interaction between suicide and lack of care for or lack of hope for oneself. Um, I think there are pieces of hope there, but really this starts, like you said, much further upstream. And our conversation really has to be at um, a concept called radical healing. And essentially that is where that is being made whole in the face of identity-based um, insults and stressors. And that is another place where I see um, more of a grassroots um, community-based focus. But I think the problem a lot of times is that churches are so divided from the realities of day-to-day -day realities of people. And so we have to have very real conversations that are uncomfortable to have, but, you know, are definitely needed day in and day out. So if I'm not getting my needs met, then that progression becomes so much more likely, um, especially in the face of opposite um, things that go against my wellness. Definitely. Yeah, thank you, Sherry, for sharing your perspective, working at another NAMI organization in a different part of um, the U.S. It's helpful for us here in Cleveland to hear a bit more about um, your experiences working with folks, you know, impacted by trauma and mental health concerns uh, in Buffalo. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Um, I did put the link in the chat to um, the survey. It will complete that for me. And it looks like we have a comment from Regina who says there needs to be more discussion and awareness of suicide and church response. This is a topic that is not addressed in the church. Meanwhile, members, including pastoral staff, are hurting and dying by suicide recently. We can't be ashamed to say depression is real. Yeah, thank you. I'll just say briefly, that was part of why I wanted to do a program like this, um, is bringing more attention to the topic of mental health and the topic of suicide in religious communities. Um, but yeah, DeAndre, you want to respond to that? Definitely. Um we have to have those discussions. I think when we don't have discussions, it's so taboo that we don't um, know how to respond. A lot of times I try to explain to kids and parents that, you know, a parent here is my kid is suicidal. They go into, 
Ma mama bear lizard brain mode, they lose um, sight because that is so, so scary and so hard to pay attention to. And so, um, you know, I think it's about exposure to conversations about it, not um, being fearful of that conversation, exposing, um, you know, exposure to conversations about it. And then we are able to kind of decrease the stigma and address that. I think stigma gets in the way of a lot of things. I think fear gets in a lot of, in the way of a lot of things in ways that um, are more, are harmful. Um, because the thoughts are there, the experiences are real. Um, just if we we can't take a, if you don't say it, it's not true or not real approach to any of this. So this is where church is having conversations about it. Um, and being real. Cleveland doing sharing hope project. I hope. I hope Cleveland sees more of those things. Yes. Yeah. So that is a um, sharing hope is a national program that comes to us from NAMI national that involves um, community conversations with um, the black community specifically around mental health and um, related topics. And uh, we do hope to offer it soon. And we'd love to get some staff trained to, to facilitate that. We do offer the Spanish language version, Compartiendo Esperanza, for um, Spanish speakers in the Cleveland area. That is a program we offer on occasion. So it's NAMI National's effort toward more identity-based, identity-specific like programs for support and education. <clears throat> All right, I'm not seeing anything else in the chat. So um, reminder, this is being recorded. We'll post it to our YouTube channel later in the week. Um, I know someone else also asked about receiving the slides. Um, we can send those to you at a later date as well. Um, otherwise, you know, thank you so much, Deandra, for doing this for us, kind of wrapping us up for the day with these programs that we've offered. Some of you joined us for those earlier ones. Hopefully these were helpful for you. And I uh, hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you, guys.